Apparently for Americans, a migration to a place several hundred miles away is no more serious than moving from one house to another, and is taken in the spirit of a pleasure party. This observation from a French traveler in 1788 neatly sums up the world of southwest Virginia in the late 18th and 19th centuries. It was a world on the move as vast tracts of newly opened land enticed Americans west into opportunity. For nearly a century after Jamestown in 1607, colonial settlements clung to the eastern seaboard, trying to establish a firm foothold in the New World. That changed in the early 1700s, when groups of wealthy Virginia planters acquired large tracts of land west of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Their well-capitalized land companies underwrote the exploration and surveying of Virginia's western lands, with an aim toward luring restless eastern Pennsylvania colonists into the frontier, and with the promise of inexpensive land on which they could prosper. Expansive land grants of hundreds of thousands of acres were surveyed, divided, and sold to the stream of Scotch-Irish, Germans, English, and African-American settlers moving southwestward along the Great Wagon Road through the Shenandoah Valley. Many settled along the New River in southwest Virginia, while others moved through the Cumberland Gap to the far reaches of Virginia, a land soon to be called Kentucky. The lure of inexpensive land on which one could prosper pulled Americans along hundreds of trails and pathways that all pointed southwestward into the uncleared, unsettled wilderness. As little roads connected with bigger roads, eventually the larger collector roads were tagged with names such as Wagon Road and the Wilderness Road. These roads were clogged with a sea of humanity and livestock. Eventually, as the trails widened from foot and horse paths, carts and wagons joined the dusty throng. Scores of hundreds of settlers that came along that road. They came down the Valley of Virginia, they came through Christiansburg, they made it to New River, they crossed at Ingalls Ferry, and then Ingalls Bridge, uh, which was a, um, a toll bridge. Um, and and then they made their way up to Newburn, that long incline from the, from the river, uh, basically following um, the Hazel Holler Road, what, what we now know as the Hazel Holler Road. But scores of hundreds of people um, on foot, on horseback, in wagons pulled by horses and mules and oxen, on their way to um, the Northwest Territories, the Southwest Territories, you know, they were, they were the, the frontiers people of, of that age, and, and they were going to, to settle America. What we don't really spend a whole lot of time talking about are the people that came along that road without any choice. In 1834, before Newburn became the county seat, an Englishman writes of watching a coffle of about 300 slaves being forced across New River. And as I talk to people about all this, I say, you know, if, there was, if that was one crossing, how many hundreds of others were there? If that was one day, how many hundreds of other days were there in which these coffles of slaves were um, marched through Newburn on their way to, to the rest of their lives without any choice? Among the scores of hundreds of people who traveled the Great Valley of Virginia along roads into the wilderness were some who stayed. Gradually, civilization crept westward, and towns, villages, and local governments were established in places along the New River in southwestern Virginia. In 1776, the county of Montgomery was created, with a county seat at Christiansburg. Thirteen years later, in 1789, Wythe County was carved out of Montgomery with the county seat of Evansham, now Withville. And by 1839, the region was populated enough that Pulaski County was created out of parts of Montgomery and Wythe counties. Around 1769, a German named Adam Hans and his family joined others traveling south from Pennsylvania on the Great Wagon Road. Hans served in the American Revolution and eventually became a significant landholder along a major western thoroughfare in what would become Pulaski County, Virginia. 
He was a keen entrepreneur who saw the good sense in establishing a town along the main wagon road that was taking settlers westward into Kentucky and beyond. Records show that prior to 1810, Hans had petitioned to have the main wagon road, which ran through his plantation, moved 180 feet up to the top of the ridge so that it would run directly through the center of town he hoped to create halfway between the established county seats of Christiansburg and Evansham. Hans knew that such a town would attract taverns and other service-oriented businesses, including blacksmiths, merchants, and wagon makers. Newburn could serve travelers and would therefore attract taverns and businesses. Hans was a businessman with a plan. Newburn, Virginia was born on March 3rd, 1810, when Hans met with a group of local residents who witnessed his signing of an agreement to erect a planned town on his plantation. Other descriptions of it, it is described as occupying a high and, uh, and airy place. It was named Newburn after Bern, Switzerland, because from that high ridge you can see the mountains in either direction, and it reminded the early German settlers of their home in Germany and, and Switzerland. When the county was formed, when Pulaski County was formed from, from Montgomery and Wythe County in 1839, the logical place to put the county seat was Newburn, uh, and the first court met there. Um, and it, it became a, a trading center, an agricultural center, and still central to all of that, a travel center. As Hans hoped, his town did prosper, with taverns and inns, a blacksmith shop, tannery, a wagon maker's shop, and three stores that sold everything from nails to straw brooms, hayseed to cigars, violin strings to boots and thread. 17 of the 28 lots were sold by 1819. Adam Hans himself ran an inn and his son, Henry, ran one of the first stores in a tavern. Several other ordinaries, or taverns, offered a complete meal at a fixed price, along with alcoholic beverages. The Haney Tavern, according to local legend, lodged Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, and Winfield Scott, along with many travelers and traders moving up and down the Wilderness Road. There were two churches, a Methodist church established in 1830, and a Christian church in 1837. In 1839, the town became the county seat for the newly formed Pulaski County. A handsome courthouse was constructed in 1842 and served the county until 1893, when it burned. The county jail was also built in the town and, although empty and in poor condition today, it serves as a reminder of a time when Newburn was the center of local government. Today, the Wilderness Road Museum is located in what were once two Hans houses, Henry Hance's store occupied the lower level of the log house he built between 1806 and 1812 on lot two of the original town plan. He followed the building specifications thoroughly with his 18 by 14 and a half foot building. Fragments of the house exterior indicate that it was weatherboarded and painted barn red. Analysis of the earliest paints used shows that the interior was painted white, while windows, frames, chair rails, and doors were painted colonial gray. Although the space seemed small to modern observers, Henry's home served not only as a dwelling, but as a store and the first Newburn post office. One of the Wilderness Road Museum's prize holdings is a ledger from Henry's store, which shows sales between 1815 and 1817. The ledger is arranged by store patron, listing items sold to each. Regular patron Giles Gordon, for instance, purchased several half pints of whiskey, a quarter pound of pepper, one penknife, one bushel of salt, shot for his gun, and $3.75 worth of sundries, most likely flour, sugar, and other staples. Over the course of two years, George Murhide purchased 17 lots of sundries, two pints of French rye, imperial tea, several quarts of whiskey, a wool hat, and two gallons of molasses. Tax records for 1815 show that Henry's own household included two slaves, three horses, four head of cattle, and a looking glass. In 1816, Henry Hance expanded the original log house to provide more room for his store, the post office and tavern. The museum's back room, measuring 22 and a half by 18 feet, was added without any door connecting it to the original log structure. 
Intended as a space for the hand store, the room had a hearth and chimney of limestone on its southeast wall. The side porch was constructed at this time with entrances to both the expanded original structure and to the Hans store. An additional area, lying today between the museum's reception area and the Henry Hans room, was added along with the architectural arch. The areas on each side of the arch formed Hans's tavern and post office beginning in 1819. At the other end of the present-day museum, Adam Hance constructed a house on Lot 4 that he and his wife occupied beginning in 1817. It wasn't a log house, as his building code specified, but one of more modern stick-built construction that would have been considered more up-to-date, befitting a land developer and businessman. The exterior was painted blue-green and the interior was painted white, with the woodwork being a light purple or lilac. The paint has been restored to reflect Adam and Margaret Hans's initial choices. Factory-made interior paints were rare until the mid-19th century. More typically, the painter mixed ground pigment into the binder by hand. Blues, and therefore purples, were the most expensive pigments and were thus used most often for woodwork. Adam's choice of paint and of non-log construction suggest a possible desire to distinguish himself as the prosperous entrepreneur he was. The room currently housing the museum bookstore and gift shop was added to Adam Hans's house between 1843 and 1846 by his son Henry, who had inherited the house in 1826. During this period, the Hanses purchased door locks, brass hinges, putty, green paint, yellow paint, turpentine, nails, and planks from local merchants. The second level of the building was raised, making the house a full two stories, and a staircase was built in the northeast end of the room. The mantle in the new room matched the federal period style, of the one in Adam's lilac-trimmed, older interior. The woodwork in the addition was painted gray. The Jabin Alexander Room, which functions today as the museum reception area, was the final addition, and it joined Henry Hans's house, tavern, store, post office, with Adam's original house, so that the two separate buildings became one. Although Adam Hance's planned village straddled a major thoroughfare in the early 19th century, the next great transportation advance of the 1800s, the railroad, bypassed Newbern. However, the railroad and the development of the coal industry in nearby communities eventually left Newbern as a relic from the past. In some ways, being passed by helped preserve the former boomtown. Newburn became a time capsule for a period when Americans were opening up a limitless frontier. Eventually, the county seat moved to the town of Pulaski, and the last vestiges of government in Newburn disappeared. As the 20th century progressed, Newburn became a sleepy little village with an enormous history. Because modern development and commercialism bypassed the village, many of the historic buildings from Hans's early vision remained. Eventually, the entire village was placed on the National Register of Historic Places, and the Wilderness Road Museum was formed to help preserve the important story that took place at this crossroads community. So, you know, I think in a lot of ways, when we look at Newburn, we, we have an opportunity to look at the, at the contradictions and the uh, conflicts and the struggles, the American story. It's, it is, yes, it's this little town in southwest Virginia, but it's as much a part of this larger American experience, and particularly because it was developed uh, as, a, as a community along the route of the Great Road.